Thank you very much. Uh, and, uh, as for all the others, I would first uh, thank the organizers, Cardinal Tuxon and uh, Vandele, Phil, uh, for this uh, fabulous uh, meeting here. And I'm really honored to be among the speakers here, um, reporting on some of the work that we have been doing at the University of uh, Stuttgart. I thought a little bit about what to talk about here in 20 minutes, and I thought I just convince you that uh, many of the things that we have been discussing here um, goes back to very basic research early on. And if we uh, talk about applications, uh, making money as fast as possible uh, with these quantum systems, then we should not forget that um, most of these ideas really originate from just curiosity-driven basic uh, research. And I want to show you my excitement about some very basic research um, and with long-range interacting quantum systems. So long-range interacting quantum systems just means you take two of those atoms in our nice uh, uh, drawing that we have on our uh, document here. You uh, separate them in space, and then you make them interact. So it's not going to be a contact interaction. It's going to be an interaction on at some distance. Yes. And one example we have seen yesterday in the spectacular talk by Misha, um, where, where these high fidelity gates are mediated over distances of many micrometers by the controlled interaction that neutral atoms can uh, experience if they are excited to very high lying uh, Rydberg state. And I will come back to that maybe at the end of my presentation. Uh, another uh, example is what we have heard about already, for example, in June's talk, uh, where we were discussing the influence of even the weakest uh, electric dipole moment in, uh, in, in atomic clocks. He was reporting about 30 microhertz of interaction energy due to the uh, long-range interaction of the driven dipoles in his uh, uh, fabulous uh, clockwork. Uh, so what I will uh, stress here uh, is that you can also think about magnetic dipoles. Um, and if you choose the right atom, um, then this magnetic dipole moment and the long-range interaction uh, associated with it can come, it can lead to actually surprising discoveries that were unexpected at the time when they were discovered. And I just show you um, one of these uh, uh, experimental discoveries here in the, in, in the actually unpublished but first uh, data that we uh, found in the lab in 2015. And so let me explain to you what you actually see here. What you see is a cold gas of the most magnetic atom in the periodic table, dysprosium, um, at a temperature of a few microkelvin on the upper left side. And then if you cool it down by just uh, letting it evaporate, to a temperature that is on the order of a few tens of nanokelvins, then you start to see a structure formation in this cloud of cold atoms. And what you see here are really in situ images um, of this uh, cloud of cold atoms. And what you see is that there is a structure that has a certain length scale, which was sort of expected at the time, because we know about uh, the uh, dispersion relation in such a magnetic quantum gas, and there is a length scale associated with the so-called roton minimum. Um, the really surprising thing at the time was that these structures were actually stable, and all our theory colleagues working in the field at the time predicted that they should be unstable. So this is a, a rare moment in the life of an experimental physicist where you make a discovery that that is not predicted in, uh, by theoreticians, and it's actually a good news. Yeah? <laughs> um, so what? Uh, why? So 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 here are more such pictures, and again the uh, structure formation can be really visualized very closely to what you know from maybe uh, ferrofluids or sort of classical magnetic uh, fluids under the name of the Rosenzweig instability. But the real surprise, as I said, was the uh, stability of these uh, structures. 
And it took uh, uh, some time, uh, maybe a few months or so, until we realized the uh, mechanism behind the stabilization here uh, has to do with quantum fluctuation. And we could show this actually experimentally by some scaling uh, uh, experiments. So the uh, theory basically behind this is, is basically a mean field theory for the uh, two kinds of interaction in such a magnetic gas. Um, here you see the Grosbeta-Yevsky equation, um, which has the normal terms, uh, the kinetic energy, the external potential. It has a term that goes like the density um, describing the, the local contact interaction, and it has a non-local, uh, also density-dependent dipolar, so a second kind of mean field. And it turns out if you tune the parameter such that those two mean fields essentially cancel each other, such that there's a, only a very small but negative mean field uh, remaining, then without anything else, the system could uh, collapse. But at that moment, the next higher order term comes into play, and that is the first order correction beyond mean field, so called LHY, Li Huang Yang correction that is known uh, since the 50s uh, for contact interacting term, uh, uh, gases. And that was discussed in a nice uh, theory paper by Lima and Pelster in 2012, also for dipolar uh, gases. The surprising thing maybe is that um, this is a repulsive term. So you, you, you make your theory better. And instead of lowering the energy, what you would expect, you actually raise the energy has to do with the three-dimensional character of the pseudo-potential and, and the, uh, in the, when we derive the uh, gross pitayevsky equation. Never mind, this uh, term is the one that is uh, stabilizing um, these uh, structures. Now, this theory predicts now um, more things. Yeah? It predicts, for example, three-dimensional bound states, droplets, of a quantum liquid that do not require any trapping potential anymore at densities that are eight orders of magnitude less dense than any other liquid uh, that we know, for example, uh, liquid helium droplet. Okay? Um, so um, there, there we, we went and, and observed those uh, droplets, so we can produce uh, self bound three dimensional uh, droplets that stay together for like 100 milliseconds or so before they finally evaporate. So we have them just floating in our um, uh, vacuum chamber, um, uh, not, not being trapped at all. Yes. Um, another consequence, um, and I should, okay, okay, I should of course mention that uh, this uh, was also observed in, uh, in Erbium, in, uh, uh, in uh, Francesca Ferlaino's group and, uh, and Lorian Chomas, and uh, a similar mechanism um, has then also been uh, implemented in a two-component uh, Bose gas, where you can also play this trick of compensating the two mean fields. Um, if you have two parameters to play with, uh, to zero and make the fluctuations the dominant uh, term in this description. Um, so you can play with these droplets. Yeah, you can make them, trap them in, a, in an elongated waveguide. You let them oscillate. So in, in this. Uh, picture you see uh, basically a phonon excitation of an array of droplets. And that's, as I said, by now a field uh, in itself that uh, uh, sort of uh, attracted a lot of attention also by a lot of theorists uh, um, uh, around the world. But another prediction of this is now that there should be a stable state of matter, a ground state, um, which is a superposition of two states of matter that we uh, discussed so far, namely uh, a superfluid and a solid. Yeah, and the very primitive uh, uh, way of imagining uh, such a state in one dimension is just shown here. Yeah, you have a wave function that is flat, that's a normal condensate, uh, that's the superfluid part, and another part of the wave function that is corrugated at a certain length scale, that's the, the solid part, if you like. And the true state that we are uh, dealing with here is a, is a superposition. And the phase between these two is, of course, important now. And uh, to cut this uh, story very short, you can predict how these uh, uh, states should look like uh, as you scan some uh, control parameter. 
Remember, I mean, in order to do this kind of experiment where the quantum fluctuations are very important, you have to fine tune the parameter. You have to fine tune something, and what we are doing here, we are fine tuning the scattering, the contact interaction by a flash buffer. And uh, we can uh, see very uh, similar pictures in situ in the experiment as predicted by, by theory, and we can also confirm that um, phase coherence exists uh, in the super solid uh, regime, which is a, a second uh, crucial point to nail down this uh, new, new state of matter by doing time of light experiments. And finally, it was important, at least for us, to uh, observe um, the, uh, the interesting excitation modes that such a new state of matter actually has in form of a goldstone mode that where you see a little bit of an animation here where basically uh, the, uh, the superfluid phonons and the, the crystalline solid uh, phonons oscillate out of phase. And I'm sure Sandro, who is a uh, uh, um, really uh, crucial uh, discussion partner for us uh, to understand all these things, will go into more detail um, about these elementary excitations and all the consequences that this new state of matter has in his talk tomorrow. So stay until the very end because his uh, contribution will be the very last one. Um, okay, so um, where is this going? Well, here you see a calculation that we did uh, trying to predict even more fancy states of matter. Uh, what you see here is as a function of atom number and scattering length. On the very left side, this blue corner is the super solid uh, state of matter that I showed to you in actually two dimensions. Um, at high scattering length, you have a normal uh, structureless Bose Einstein condensate. But on the right side now, for increasing atom number, you see that there is, there is more to be discovered. Yes, There are uh, structures which course, consist of hexagonal uh, arrangements of voids. Um, and there are even what is called a labyrinth structures where the, uh, the, the quantum fluid is sort of sneaking uh, sneaking around, just like this ferrofluid, this classical ferrofluid that I showed you as a movie on the right. Yeah? And uh, these are obviously highly degenerate uh, ground states um, in this system that we are looking forward to explore in the future. So, um, but if I have uh, some more time, I would... Uh, actually uh, also like to discuss the uh, Rydberg atoms with you, because the strength of this interaction is stunning. I mean, the high fidelity that Misha has shown in the quantum computing is based on this extremely strong interaction between Rydberg atoms. Some of the pioneers of the Rydberg atoms are really also in the, in the audience. And what I want to show you here is that it's even that strong that you don't even need cold to observe this so-called Rydberg blockade. Okay? So it even works for room temperature atoms or even above room temperature atoms in a thermal vapor cell. And this is my cartoon now of the uh, blockade mechanism. Misha has shown a similar one, um, where you take an ensemble of atoms, you excite them, and due to this very strong interaction, the the Rydberg atoms have to uh, keep a distance, yes, which is called the blockade radius. This blockade radius for cold atoms is on the order of 10 micrometers. For thermal atoms, as they are moving fast, it is on the order of one micrometer, but that's still larger, for example, than the optical wavelength. Yeah? So it's still an interesting thing. So if you uh, make an, a, a cell, a, let's say a glass cell, that has a dimension that is smaller than one micrometer, we would expect that we should be able to excite a single and only one Rydberg atom, although there are thousands of atoms in such a thing. Okay. We call this a super atom, but really the idea goes back to a paper, a seminal paper, Misha, where he shows that the excited state is, an, is a collective state where any one in this ensemble can be excited, but you don't know which one, and so you have to write down the quantum mechanical uh, superposition state, and now the phases, these plus signs here, are actually important, and if the atoms start to move, of course, 
these phases will be scrambled. Now, in a the thermal vapor cell, this time scale is one or two nanoseconds. So it is uh, fast, it's fast uh, decaying. But what I want to show you is that, and that holds actually also then for gate operations later on, that we can do this Rydberg excitation on a time scale faster than that. And that means we should be able to generate this kind of state even uh, in a thermal vapor cell. And the way we show this experimentally is we convert this Rydberg atom back into a single photon, and really only a single photon, not just a, uh, a classical light state. Uh, so what this actually is, is a single photon source. Uh, if we combine the Rydberg excitation with a de-excitation, we actually use three waves to produce a fourth wave, so it's a four-wave leaking experiment. And as this ensemble is larger than the optical wavelengths, this, emit, this photon will be emitted in the forward direction. So here is our cell. Yeah, it looks. Uh, uh, you can see the Newton rings. Yeah, so so if you see these Newton rings, you know that the thickness of the cell is on the order of the wavelengths. We just put it between two lenses, focus the laser beam through it. I have. I, you, we can discuss more about this. Here's the crucial result. You see the G2 correlation function of the light that is emitted in the forward direction, and you see at zero delay, it's not zero, but it is uh, small. Yeah, it's 0.2 or something like this. So clearly, a non-classical source is not perfect, but uh, uh, to me, that is the demonstration that this uh, uh, collective state, quantum state, actually was alive in this uh, cell at least for a nanosecond. Okay. Now, uh, this is the basis, and now come to the perspective. I mean, uh, uh, also for, for this uh, neutral atom uh, quantum computing platform, and we, as many others uh, also in the room, are actually following uh, Misha's uh, uh, ideas here. Uh, and I show the uh, two, two qubit uh, inf uh, infidelity, basically, um, uh, of the Rydberg platform as compared to the other platforms. And due to this uh, work of uh, Misha and uh, actually also the Caltech group, Manuel Endres, we have now uh, uh, infidelities that are comparable with all the other platforms. But what is more, I mean, Misha has shown spectacularly how to maybe go towards error correction. Atoms have a lot of uh, choices to encode a qubit. And uh, what uh, has been used in, in Misha's work is nuclear qubits, uh, in other people's work, optical qubits. What we are following, and that's our really baby step contribution to this, is to demonstrate the fine structure qubit in Schwanzium now, and also the circular state qubit, which involves circular Rydberg states in a principal quantum number of uh, 79, which is now oscillating in our lab. So starting from there, we hope we can also eventually make a contribution. And um, here is, if you are, if you want to know more about uh, our project on uh, on this Rydberg quantum computer platform, you you are welcome to uh, uh, visit this page. So, thank you very much for your attention.